This is going to be verse by verse of Romans chapter 15. And we're going to look at the subject of dangers of not reading the King James Bible. So getting right into it, if you neglect your Bible, you will have a hard time edifying another. How are you going to edify another Christian without that which edifies? Romans 15, 1 through 2 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. So in chapter 14, we learned how we shouldn't use our liberty in Christ to offend a weaker brother. And if you're strong, you need to bear the infirmities of the weak. Edify your neighbor. You need to help him grow in the Lord. You're not trying to just, you know, be a jerk and use your liberty in Christ to offend him. Maybe he's against some things that aren't necessarily a sin. He's got some standards and convictions against some things that aren't a sin, but you do those things, but you don't have to do those things when he's around. And it will be hard for you to be the strong one if you're not daily in the Scriptures. How are you going to bear the infirmities of the weak? How can you lead a brother or sister for their good to edification if you're not in the book? Uh, Romans fourteen nineteen says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. And you don't see much of that today. All you really see is people just edifying their self, especially in the charismatic movement. All the people getting up saying, you know, I'm speaking in tongues, and they're not edifying everybody else. They're edifying themselves. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So, we need to comfort one another, edify one another. And how can you edify another if you aren't being edified yourself? If you're being edified, then you're being instructed and improved. And you do this for yourself when you read the book, when you listen to a biblical sermon. Uh, this is how you grow in the Lord. And if you're not growing yourself, how can you help someone else grow? Uh, how can a baby uh, help another baby grow? Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.23 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So there's some things that don't edify. But the scriptures do. We should stick with the book. Now Romans 15 1 through 2. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification. So this book doesn't teach to please ourselves, but to please others first. And the order of who to please is Jesus first, of course, others second, and then you last. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So we need to bear the infirmities of the weak. We need to worry about pleasing others and edifying others, and not so much about ourselves all the time. And we're living in perilous times where people are lovers of their own selves. Now number two, what's another danger of neglecting the Word of God. Without reading the book, you can't follow the Lord's example. It's kind of hard to follow in His steps if you don't know His character. Do you know much about the Lord Jesus Christ? It says in Romans 15, 3, For even Christ pleased not Himself, but as it is written, The reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. So the Lord left the riches of heaven and came down to die for man, he didn't live for himself. He lived a sinless life for you. He died on the cross for you and was buried and resurrected for you. And in Philippians 2, 4, and 5, Paul says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If you don't stay in the Scriptures, reading about the Lord Jesus Christ, read those Gospels every day, then you're not going to be able to follow the Lord's example and see how He put others first. He laid down His life for His friends. 
and the mentality today that people have is I need to make myself happy. I need to worry about myself. Myself comes first. But when Jesus was at the store, he didn't run people over with his buggy to get to the next aisle. Uh, he wasn't running people over on Black Friday trying to rip through the pallets. Uh, Jesus Christ didn't blow his horn at someone who didn't start driving as soon as the light turned green. That wasn't his character. He wasn't looking out for old number one, as they say, even though he is number one because the Bible says in all things he might have the preeminence. Uh, he put, he would even put the Diotrephes first, who loveth to have the preeminence. You know, he put people first. Romans 15, 3 is actually quoting Psalm 69, 8 through 9, which says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. And you see how all throughout the Old Testament you see prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reproach fell on Jesus Christ. But he took it not to please himself, obviously, but for others. And a daily reading of the Gospels. Get you like five chapters in the Gospels every day. Can help you walk with Jesus Christ and follow his example. Now moving on, if you don't want to read the Scriptures, then you won't know the Bible characters or the Bible stories. And so much truth can be gained just from reading the simple stories about the characters in the Bible. If you don't like reading First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings, that's where some of the greatest stories in the Bible are. Uh, Romans fifteen four says, "For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope." So all things written in the Old Testament, that's the things written aforetime, are written for our learning. Not just the New Testament, the New Testament, and not just the Pauline epistles. The whole Bible should be preached and taught, should be read and memorized, and rightly divided. But it's a shame that people don't really know a lot of the great Old Testament characters just because they've neglected to read the Bible. And I've talked to people who thought Moses baptized Jesus. You know, they said, was it Moses that baptized Jesus? I've talked to people who, who thought David committed adultery with Delilah. I've talked to people who thought Samson's name was Hercules. They thought Hercules was the one who knocked down the pillars. And But as Jesus always said, have you not read, have you not read these stories? The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. What have you been reading? A lot of people are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And there are people constantly learning, but instead of getting smarter, they're getting dumber. It's not that way when you learn from the Bible. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And a lot of people only get comfort from the Scriptures and don't get into the doctrine. They just go to the Scriptures for comfort. And some people just go to the Bible and focus on the doctrine and the prophecy and never get the comfort from the Bible. But there have been times when I didn't even care about the doctrine. I just needed something for comfort. But comfort comes from the book and the Holy Spirit. And verse 4 shows us that it gives us hope. And when we see these Old Testament characters mess up and get back up, it gives us hope. When you see that David committed adultery and did these horrible sins and, and, you know, Peter, you know, denied the Lord three times. Abraham lied. Noah got drunk. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. You know, all these people, great heroes of the faith, sinned. And yet, Noah's called a preacher of righteousness. But David's a man after God's own heart. You know, all these people in the hall of faith in Hebrews... So that shows us that even though maybe we've messed up, we can get comfort and hope that, you know, we can be even greater than we were before. But moving on, another thing you miss out on if you reject Bible reading is you won't be like-minded with the brethren. Romans 15, 5 says, Now the God of patience and consolation 
grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. For example, look at a Christian who reads the Bible and one who doesn't read the Bible. The one who reads the Bible has the Bible for his, for his final authority and the other one who doesn't read the Bible just has his own opinion of what he thinks is right and wrong. And many times what we think is right is actually wrong and what we think is, is wrong is actually right. And if two Christians are hanging out together and one doesn't read the Bible and the other one does, they're not going to see eye to eye many times. And the more a person reads the book, the more his religion and tradition gets knocked off of him. And that, that is if he will take the book over his you know denomination and religion and tradition. And someone religion religious isn't going to see eye to eye with someone with pure religion and the tradition taught by Paul in the epistles. And one will have a biblical view and one will have a religious view. The one who doesn't read the Bible is going to have the religious view that he's going to go by as what's right from wrong. But the one who reads the book is going to have the book telling him what's right and wrong. And if... And if Two people are both reading the book daily. They're going to be talking about stuff and they're going to see things eye to eye. They're going to be like-minded with each other. And the danger of not reading the book is you're not going to be like-minded with other Bible-believing Christians. Romans 15, 5 through 6 says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind... And with one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord wants us, for the most part, to believe the same doctrine. And there are some things that we just can't budge on. We can't, you know, we, we can't look over if someone disagrees on some certain things. But there are some things that are just so minor that we can disagree and keep staying in fellowship. For example, I don't fellowship with someone who thinks water baptism saves but I can fellowship with someone who believes in a post-tribulation rapture. I won't fellowship with someone who says there is more than one way to heaven. But I'll fellowship with someone who believes Enoch is one of the two witnesses instead of Elijah. There's some things that I'm not going to break fellowship over. I'm not going to break fellowship over someone who doesn't believe there's a gap between the first two verses of the Bible. I'm not going to break fellowship over some uh, over something like what shape they believe the world's in. You know, things like that. But there's some things we have to break fellowship, some things we don't have to. But for the most part, the Lord wants us to have the same doctrine. For example, He wants us all to believe salvation is by grace through faith without works. You know, He wants us to be like-minded on these things. And Paul says that we may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. If our motive is to please God and not ourselves, then we're going to glorify God no matter what minor disagreements our friends may have with us. Because our main thing isn't to defend our beliefs, it's to glorify God. And the more I've read the scriptures, the more I've gotten closer to God, and the more I realize I'm not worth shooting. And this makes me very long-suffering and patient with other people because why should I expect them to be perfect when I'm a sinner just like they are? And if you've been around a lot of new Christians or just overgrown Christian babies who either haven't read the Bible much or just don't let the Word talk to them, you'll notice they are very quick to throw around the word heretic and quick to call everyone a false prophet and a false teacher and call people unsaved and break fellowship over everything. You know, it's like when when you're a kid and, you know, someone st another kid steals your toy, you say, I'm not your friend no more. You know, that's how a lot of Christian baby Christians are today. You know, if, if they hear another one say something they don't agree with, they say, well, I'm not his friend no more. And if you neglect to read the book, then you're not going to see eye to eye with another Christian when you should. And you can receive your brother even with his minor disagreements even with maybe a fault or a sin he's committed in the past because the bible says ye that are spiritual restore such in one in the spirit of meekness if a brother be overtaken in a fault ye which are spiritual restore such in one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest thou also be tempted 
Romans 15, 7, Wherefore, receive ye one another. As Christ also received us to the glory of God, don't just receive the people who's going to be give you an advantage, maybe give you an advantage in your ministry. A lot of people I've noticed will, say a big shot preacher come in, and they're going to give them advantage in the ministry. You know, they can become friends with him, and, you know, they can become friends with all these other crowd of preachers and big shot Christians. You know, they're nice to that guy. But if some nobody, no name comes in that stinks and stuff, you know, they may not make much of him. But just receive you one another. All Christians, there's never an excuse not to receive another Christian who's trying to live right. And the Lord doesn't agree with all your doctrine, but he receives you. And almost every time I pray, I say, Lord, if I'm wrong, then show me in your book. How often do you do this? Some people are scared to know if they're wrong. I'm more scared to know. I'm more scared to not know if I'm wrong. I want to know if I'm wrong so I can change. But now moving on, if you neglect the book, then you won't understand right division. You won't understand how to rightly divide as in it talks about in Timothy there. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So in Romans 15.8 it says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. When Jesus came, he came to be a minister of the circumcision, which is the Jews. Now this doesn't mean he wouldn't deal with the Gentiles he did on occasion. But for the most part, he came into his own and his own received him not. He came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and after the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God turned to the Gentiles. And now he's dealing with the Gentiles primarily. And when a Jew or Gentile gets saved, Paul says they are no longer Jew or Gentile. And this is something that wasn't going on in the Lord's earthly ministry, but it is today. Jesus Christ was primarily dealing with the circumcision. And Paul is primarily dealing to the Gentiles, as he says in verse 16 of the chapter we're studying. It says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Now, Paul was primarily to the Gentiles, but his burden was for his kinsmen according to the flesh. He still went after the Jews. So Paul, this doesn't mean, just because he was ministered to the Gentiles doesn't mean he didn't witness to Jews. But if you read the book, then you'll understand right division. You'll, being, you'll understand that the Bible mentions three groups of people, Jews, Gentiles, and church. You'll understand, you know, dispensationalism. And I know a lot of people hate that word, but everyone is a little bit of a dispensationalist. Even if you just believe there's an Old and New Testament. I mean, dispensationalism isn't what people make it out to be. It's that you recognize there's a difference, for example, between people who were sacrificing animals to now when we have a perfect sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we don't sacrifice animals anymore. So if you just believe that, then you're a little bit of a dispensationalist, even if it's just a little bit. Even if you hate the word, you still are one. Romans 15, 8 says, Not I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So when Jesus Christ came in the flesh, he confirmed all the promises about his first coming in the Old Testament. And a reading of the Old Testament, while in light of the New Testament, will show you Jesus Christ on every page. Now, when you read the Bible, you need to approach it using right division. As Paul, like I said in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of the truth. So you know how the Gospels, you know the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are in the New Testament part of the Bible, but the New Testament really doesn't start until the death of the testator. In Hebrews 9.17, it says, for a, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no more strength at all while the testator liveth. So until Jesus Christ died on the cross, it's still really in the Old Testament. 
because the New Testament starts with the death of the testator. And if you read the book, you'll see how the Gospel of John is something different than the other three Gospels because John wrote the Gospel after John had already read the Pauline epistles. So he's looking back at Jesus Christ's earthly ministry in light of the Pauline epistles. And that is why it has so much doctrine for the church. Because the Pauline epistles are primary, primarily doctrine for church-age Christians. And John had all those at his fingertips. But moving on to verses 9 through 12. In Romans 15 it says, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, are ye Gentiles, and laud him, are ye people. And again Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. So you see in these verses here, where it says, as it is written, when he says that, that means he's quoting something in the Old Testament. So he's quoting verses from the Old Testament because just like he said, the Old Testament's for our learning. And many times when you listen to a preacher or a teacher, they'll take something from the Old Testament that doesn't apply to us today in the doctrinal sense, and he will use it as practical application. For example... Just something for example, in Second Chronicles 7.14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal, heal their land. See, this is talking about Israel, but you can also take it for practical application for us today. Because if we seek God and humble ourselves, you know, God's going to do something for us too. And that's one of the biggest examples so Paul quoted verses here in this chapter from the Old Testament that didn't apply doctrinally to church-age Christians for today because they were doctrinally for Christ's reign. But he applied them to the church for spiritual application. So Romans fifteen nine, which says, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing into thy name. This is quoting Psalms 18.49 which says, Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. Romans 15.10 says, And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. This is quoting Deuteronomy 32.43 which says, Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Our Romans 15.11 says, And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And Psalms 117.1, O oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations, praise him, all ye people. See, these verses are talking doctrinally about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ when everyone... Even the enemies of God will have to praise the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now Romans fifteen twelve says, And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. And this is taken from Isaiah. Isaiah eleven ten says, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So you see how Paul took these verses from the Old Testament that talked about the millennium and got practical application for the church, which is just fine to do so today. Now, next, if you skip out on reading the old black book, you miss out on hope, joy, peace, goodness, and so on and so forth. Romans fifteen thirteen and 14 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. 
No, there is something about reading the book that gives you peace. It says in verse 13, Not a God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. When you believe the word, there's it gives you peace. Because if you're saved and you know it, John said, These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. If you read that and believe it, you get peace. If you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and read where Paul says we're going out in a rapture, that'll give you peace. It's like when everything around me is a lie, the word is true. When someone betrays me, it doesn't matter because I've got the book. When some material thing I have breaks... Oh, well, we don't need it because we have the book. The God of hope fills you with joy and peace when you read the book. And that's why I hate when a preacher, a preacher of all people, says a word in the book ain't supposed to be in it. The man is led by the devil and needs to get out of the pulpit if he's saying a word really should be this or this word really should be that. That's like Elijah or one of the men of God in the Old Testament. If they said, thus saith the Lord. But it really meant, he really meant to say this, guys. Thus saith the Lord, but he really meant this word or this message. No, Elijah didn't do that. That's like Jonah going to Nineveh and saying, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But guys, he really meant like 39 and a half days. That's stupid. Who in the world do you think you are to correct the book? When a man gets up and corrects the book, even if he's sincere, he's deceived, and he, he's being crooked. He's crooked as a dog's hind leg and full of the devil. So watch out for listening to anybody who corrects the book. Romans fifteen fourteen says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So how are you going to get filled with knowledge? It talks about in the minor prophets that God's people being destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know why you can't endure temptation? You haven't equipped yourself with knowledge of this book on how to do it. You know why you can't admonish your brother? You know why you can't kindly correct him and lead him down the right road? Because you don't know what the right word is. You've been neglecting the book. Romans fifteen fourteen says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So read this book. You'll be full of goodness, full of knowledge, full of truth. You'll have so much goodness and truth bubbling up in you and you're just looking for somebody to pour it out on. And most people don't want any part of the Bible. They just want the things of this world. So it's not going to make you popular, but at least you'll have a word for somebody when they need it. Romans fifteen fifteen says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. So you know how Paul wrote boldly? He was confident in what God had given him. He didn't hold the truth in unrighteousness. There is something about being saved and knowing it. There is something about having the truth in your hand and knowing the word of the Lord endureth forever. And even though they might take away the paper it's printed on, you still have it hidden in your heart. And even if you don't get another copy, you know it's still somewhere because the Word endures forever. And knowing this fact can give a boldness that the toughest man in the world doesn't have. Romans fifteen fifteen says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. So Paul, as he said before, has a dispensation of grace. And that's not a period of time. It just means the Lord dispensed grace to Paul. He gave out grace to Paul. 
in Romans 15, 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So Paul, he gives us the gospel. He said he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And he gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, how that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. But he says here in this verse that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. And that offering up of the Gentiles, if you look at Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, unto God, which is your reasonable service. Are you offering up yourself? Are you presenting your body a living sacrifice? So Romans fifteen sixteen that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. So he's primarily to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. If you're sanctified by the Holy Ghost, then you're set apart for his service. Romans fifteen seventeen and 18, I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. So Paul is talking about how the Lord has used his ministry to reach the Gentiles to make them obedient. Romans 16 talks about the obedience of faith. How are you, how are you obedient to the gospel? You're obedient to the gospel by believing it. Not by getting water baptized or anything else. Not any other works. But Paul says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. So the, these, he's, he's got them obedient. And they're not just reading the word. They're also a doer of the word. And he's done this, he says in Romans fifteen nineteen through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So Paul had the sign gifts and apostle of, of an apostle. He says through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. And Paul fully preached the gospel of Christ, so he preached how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and how, how he's buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So do you know where to find the clear gospel presentation in this book? That's a danger of not reading it because you won't know how to lead someone to salvation. You, won't, you wouldn't even know how to lead them down the Romans road. And I guarantee you, most Christians, if you asked them where that clear gospel presentation is in the Bible, they couldn't show it to you. Romans fifteen twenty, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, yes, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Paul was going around to cover the spots that hadn't been hid. And maybe take some time to figure out where Christ hasn't been preached in your town and start there. Romans fifteen twenty one. But as it is written to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. And that's a quote from Isaiah fifty two twelve. The Gentiles would see and hear and understand. Uh, as Isaiah fifty two and fifty three talks about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and you can see Jesus Christ on every page in the Old Testament, as we said before. But in Acts eight, when the Ethiopian eunuch gets saved. And Philip comes, tells him about Jesus, preach Jesus to him. He gets saved after reading Isaiah 53, which tells him about the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at Acts 8, 34 through 35, it says, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at this same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So that verse, it's a quote from Isaiah fifty-two fifteen. 
And as I said before, Jesus Christ is on every page. And now Paul is going to show you a love for the brethren that you should have. And you're taught these simple truths just by a simple reading of the word. Romans 15, 22 says, For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. Uh, Paul has been ministering to so many others that he hasn't had a chance to get to them yet. That and Satan also hinders him, as he's talked about before. Satan doesn't want you getting together with another Christian. He certainly doesn't want a preacher coming your way. Uh, Romans fifteen twenty three. But now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you. So he has a great desire to see other Christians. And this is a lot different than these guys going around today saying we need to isolate ourselves from Christians in these last days and that Christians should just isolate themselves and go out in the mountains away from other Christians. That's nothing more than the devil using that man to get people to divide so the devil can divide and conquer. Romans fifteen twenty four says, Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way titherward by you. If first I be somewhat filled with your company. So Paul is planning on coming to them on his way to Spain. But he says, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it has pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. So Paul is going to Jerusalem to minister to the poor saints. And notice the Bible talks more about helping the saints more than it does giving to the lost. Have you made a contribution to the poor saints? Maybe not with money, but just by giving them something. Are you even friends with the poor saints? And as Paul said before, be not high-minded, but condescend to men of low estate. You should have poor friends, and you should have rich friends. And Paul says in Galatians 2.10, Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. And there really isn't many poor saints when it comes to having a place to live and a few things to eat. But they may be poor in other ways that you could help them. Now he says in verse 27, It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have, made, have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. So what Paul is saying here is if someone is helping you spiritually like your pastor or your teacher, then it's good to help them with material things, the carnal things. Carnal is pertaining to the flesh. Uh, Romans fifteen twenty eight. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. So when Paul has completed this task that he just mentioned, then he's going to come to them. So he's he's got his priorities straight. He's not going to... Forget about the first thing that he purposed to do. And we should think about that and apply that to our lives. If you tell somebody you're going to do something, and then you tell somebody else you're going to do something, you need to do what you told the first person you were going to do first and then move on to the next person. Now Romans fifteen twenty nine says, And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And he's not referring to a full gospel at, in the sense of how the Pentecostals, Charismatics teach it. He's just, you know, Paul fully preached the gospel. Paul did it with his might. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He said in verse 19 of this same chapter, chapter I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And now Romans 15, 30, And I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So if you're not involved with other Christians, then how are you going to do prayer requests? And the danger of not reading the Scriptures is that you don't notice all these clear verses about fellowship. And if you're not living close to other Christians, you can contact them by mail, by email, you know, through the internet. Just do the best you can do. Romans fifteen thirty one through 32 says that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea 
and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. So he says, come to you with joy by the will of God, because if you do it out of the will of God, you lose your joy. And he says in verse 33, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And outside of the will, the God of peace won't give you as much peace. But this has been Romans chapter 15.